Welcome to this lecture on medical law, reviewing the Mental Capacity Act of 2005. Again, here is our legal disclaimer. The information I am providing here is intended for education purposes only, and with all information provided being well documented in the public domain. Under no circumstances shall we accept any liability for any loss or damage incurred as a result of improper use of this lecture. If you require independent legal advice, please seek professional legal opinion. The Mental Capacity Act was introduced in 2005 and came into force by 2007 in both England and Wales. The Act provides a legal framework to facilitate decision-making processes in patients greater than 16 years old who lack capacity. Further, the Act provides legal support for individuals wishing to make advanced, informed decisions to cover circumstances where they may lack capacity in the future. There are five main principles, as defined by the Act, which a doctor is required to follow by law. Firstly, a patient has presumed capacity unless proven otherwise. A patient, unable to make a decision, cannot receive treatment unless all practical steps have been taken to support them in their decision. Just because a patient makes an unwise decision in the doctor's opinion, it doesn't mean that they lack capacity. Where a person lacks capacity, Decisions must be made by the doctor in the patient's best interest. Where capacity is lacking, decisions made must be the least restrictive of the individual's fundamental rights or freedoms. In order to abide by the principles set about by this Act, clinicians therefore require a good understanding of patient capacity and how to perform a formal assessment. Thankfully, the Act provides us with a definition. A patient lacks capacity in relation to a matter if, at the material time, he is unable to make a decision for himself in relation to the matter because of an impairment of or a disturbance in the function of the mind or brain. Where a concern exists regarding a patient's ability to have capacity, a clinician should proceed to a capacity assessment. Capacity itself is formally assessed for a given patient for a specific moment in time and for a specific decision that is required to be made. This is because capacity to make decisions may change over time. Further, a patient may have capacity to make decisions over straightforward treatments, for example, taking antibiotics for an infection, but not make an informed decision over a complicated surgery. In order for a patient to demonstrate capacity, they must satisfy four key components. Firstly, they must be able to understand the information being provided by the doctor. They must be able to retain this information for long enough in order to weigh up the information and communicate a decision to the doctor, which can be by any means necessary. Where a patient is found to lack capacity, the decision to treat the patient lies with the doctor. It remains the doctor's duty to consult the opinions of those individuals who know the patient best. Friends and family can provide vital information regarding the views of the patient prior to their loss of capacity and what the patient would have likely have wanted in those circumstances. However, the doctor must display vigilance for family members that may have ulterior motives. For example, refusing cancer treatment for a loved one in order to gain an inheritance earlier. The Mental Capacity Act also permits patients to nominate an individual, whom they trust, to make important decisions on their behalf should the patient lose capacity at some point in the future. Nomination of this individual should take place prior to the patient's loss of capacity. Two forms of lasting power of attorney actually exist. These include lasting power of attorney for personal welfare, which encompasses a broad range of decisions inclusive of healthcare, and 
lasting power of attorney for property and affairs, which does not provide authority for healthcare. This is a significant difference which healthcare professionals must demonstrate awareness for. Where a patient wishes to make an advanced decision regarding their care, in anticipation of a time in which they may lack capacity, the Mental Capacity Act supports this by providing the legal groundwork for advanced directives. Where this decision regards the potential refusal of treatment, this is known as advanced refusal. One common example of an advanced refusal is where a Jehovah's Witness declares that they would never wish to have a blood transfusion should they lose capacity and need one, even where such a refusal may result in end of life. All advanced directives, in order to be valid, must be in writing, signed and witnessed. The document is only legally binding where individuals completing the advanced directives are greater than 18 years old, the document details the treatment being refused and the specific circumstances where the directive becomes valid, the patient has not already appointed a lasting power of attorney, the patient must lack capacity at the time of the event and there must not be any doubt regarding the patient's wishes. For example, the patient should never have indicated at any moment any wishes against the advanced directive. Where an incapacitated patient does not have a close family member or friend, an independent mental capacity advocate must be appointed. IMCAs, for short, are not appointable where the patient has a designated lasting power of attorney or the Court of Protection has appointed a suitable welfare deputy. However, in an emergency circumstance where a doctor is not able to access an independent mental capacity advocate, the doctor is permitted to proceed with treatment providing it is in the patient's best interests. OK, so let's review what we've learned. The Mental Capacity Act of 2005 became adopted into English and Welsh law in 2007. It provides the much needed legal framework for patients 16 years and above who lack capacity. In addition, it creates new roles to support incapacitated patients, such as the nomination of lasting power of attorneys, independent medical advocates, plus the introduction of advanced directives permitting patients to make their own decisions regarding treatment, anticipating a time in the future where they may lack capacity. Thank you for watching this lecture. In the next lecture, we will review the Mental Health Act of 1983, which was amended in 2007. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe, click the bell and leave us a comment down below, letting us know where you are studying because our team love to know. Any questions and topic requests are of course welcome too. See you next time.